Hello, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making here at Eric Schaefer Guitars. Luthier's Mercantile is closing, which is freaking nuts. We're going to talk about that later. Not right now. We'll get into that. Uh, just a couple housekeeping things. First of all, for you guys in the members forum, there is a deal going on right now for Cross Rock cases. I just started an arrangement with Cross Rock and I got them into the online guitar building school as a mm, uh, sponsor is not the right word. What do I call them? As a, a discount vendor, because I provide you guys with discounts for students of my classes. And um, so anyway, uh, that discount and the instructions for how to use it are in the members forum. So check that out if you are a member. If you're not a member, hey, there's just another reason to buy one of my online courses. That's how you become a member. You buy an online course, and you then have access to these discounts and a forum where other builders from all around the world get together and we talk about this kind of stuff that we're doing right here. In fact, a lot of the questions we're going to do today are straight from the members forum. So by the time this video goes out, I think it will be on the last day or the day before the last day of this sale for Cross Rock cases. It's for their specifically for their fiberglass and their carbon fiber cases, which are the, the really good high-end cases that you actually want on a good high-end guitar. Because uh, Cross Rock has a very wide net as far as products that they offer. And they do the gig bags and the cheap wooden cases and, and stuff like that. But um, they also have some really nice fiberglass cases, which is what I use, and carbon fiber, which is, I'm sure, even nicer. I haven't checked those out yet myself. But hey, it's carbon fiber, so super lightweight and super strong and durable. Now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is in the members forum, I asked you guys a question, just kind of throwing it out there. I want to gauge your interest in a nine day parlor guitar build workshop. So as many of you know, since 2014, I've been doing workshops here in my shop where students come out, just two students to a workshop, and we build an orchestra model guitar in nine days. I want to try a similar format, but for a parlor guitar, um, if you guys are interested. So I've been, a lot of people I've noticed have been interested in my parlor guitar build videos, and I just want to see if that interest translates into a workshop. Okay, uh, that's it. That's all the housekeeping. Let's get to your questions. First question comes from Larry Kuhn. Larry writes, Hi all, and thanks Eric for maintaining this Discord server. Well, thank you for um, acknowledging me and thanking me for that. Appreciate it. He writes, I have a quick question that doesn't seem to be answered anywhere I can find online or in books. I'm working on my first slotted headstock. Do builders typically finish the inside of the slots? If so, what's the technique? Or if they're left unfinished, what's the best method of masking it off? Just carefully tape it up, or is there a trick? For example, the trick I use on standard headstocks is to stick foam earplugs in the tuner holes. It's a good trick. He has a nice picture of his headstock as well, so I'll put that in there. But also, LC Guitars responded, and he has a great answer. I have done two slotted headstocks in the past. Both I have finished the inside of the slots. How to get it in there depends on the finish you are using. If you are doing true oil, just wipe it in with a cloth. If spraying, it's not too hard to lightly mist some product in. So yeah, I've never done a slotted headstock, but I can say that um, what he's saying about the true oil is correct. That's the easiest thing to do is just use a wipe on finish. And it doesn't have to be true oil. He mentioned true, we're all kind of true oil nuts in this forum, but actually, Shellac would be fine, really anything that you, you wipe on. Classical guitars traditionally used oil varnish finishes and shellac finishes. So these are all hand rubbed. And so actually a lot of the design features that you see between the classical world and the steel string world are kind of a reflection of the finishes that were used at the time. Right? So steel string guitars are a product of industry, you know, 
commercially built instruments. And so you're not gonna see slotted headstocks typically on that because that throws a wrench into the works as far as spray finishing is concerned. It's difficult or impossible to do. Now he says you can just lightly mist it in there. Um, I'd imagine that'd be pretty difficult to do. Again, I haven't done a slotted headstock, but that would be a little bit of a challenge to actually get it in there and have it sort of self-level and have your application be smooth. Now, if you don't mind the application being a little shoddy in that area, then sure, go for it. But I would highly recommend, uh, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to true oil the neck and spray the body, which a lot of people do. That people like the feel of a true oil neck. So some people will only true oil the neck and spray the body. So that, that might be something to try. But if you are gonna try spraying it, then I would just do, like he said, it sounds like he's tried that before and just lightly missed it in there. Okay. So let's see what else we got here. Uh, I feel like I had something else to say about that. Hmm. Well, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll come back to it. Let's see what else we got next. And R. Breen writes, what does the angle on the headboard do? And headboard, he means headstock. I've never heard the term headboard. I don't think anybody calls it that, but if they do, I apologize. Uh, so yeah, he's talking about the headstock. What does the angle on the headstock do? The plans that I have say do a 10 degree angle and your video says a 15 degree angle. So you can do either of those 10 degree or 15. Um, you, you need a headstock angle because that's what gives pressure down on the nut so that your strings are firmly anchored to the nut so that your scale length begins right at that point and also so that when you play the strings they um, the amount of tension you have against that nut is really going to determine how much projection and sustain you get out of the instrument so if you have very little or no angle then you have very little pressure against the nut and at the worst case, the strings can sound almost like a sitar, but even in more moderate cases, you will just really notice the difference in the lack of, again, oomph that you're getting out of the guitar, the projection and the sustain. It's just gonna not sound like a great guitar. So you want an angle on the headstock. If you go way too far with the headstock, like Gibson was notorious for its 17 degree, I think it was 17, some Gibson geek out there can correct me if it's 17.5 or something, but they ha had very extreme headstock angles and those instruments broke all the, the headstocks snapped very frequently. So you're kind of dancing on that line. You wanna find a good strong angle to anchor the strings, but you don't want to go so far as to create a liability in the strength of your headstock joint, okay? So you can follow that 10 degree that that other person says or you can do 15 it's not gonna affect anything else in the build if you choose one or the other you could still if you're following along with my course you can still follow everything else the same and just do that 10 degree angle if you liked what you saw in the plans there now some electric guitars like fender for example has a flat headstock but they have a little string tree it's a little piece of hardware that is actually meant to kind of clasp over the strings and pull them down at that angle. So in that way, you can avoid actually creating the scarf joint to set your angle. You could just use a, a straight billet of wood and use that piece of hardware to create it. You don't see that on acoustic guitars though. I'm, I'm just mentioning it because it's out there and that question might come up, but uh, that's more of an electric guitar thing. The proper way to do this really is, uh, at least in the acoustic guitar world, is to just put in that scarf joint. Or you don't need to do the scarf joint if you're cutting it out of a very large solid billet of mahogany. You can actually cut out the whole shape, including the neck angle. But that's getting a little far astray from what your actual question was. You just wanted to know, uh, essentially, What's gonna happen if I you know, vary my angle between an extreme angle and a less extreme angle? But hey, the 15 degrees that I always do, my headstocks, I've literally never seen a single one break. Nobody's ever messaged me back pictures of their broken headstock or sent a guitar back for repair or anything like that. Not that it can't happen or won't happen, knock on wood, 
but it, it actually surprises me even that it's not even happened once. So that's kind of cool. So anyway, the 15, I have a lot of confidence in. I've been doing it for a long time, and a lot of guitars are built with 15 uh, degree angles. So honestly, I would encourage you to just con continue on with that. But hey, it doesn't take much more than that. Like I said, 17 degrees starts to get pretty high. And if you go beyond that, it really is no bueno. Well, let me explain what happens, actually, why, why that is the case. Because it's actually two things are feeding into that problem simultaneously, which makes it even more likely that you're going to snap a headstock. So as you increase the angle, you're increasing the leverage off of that thin piece of wood that you're using as the headstock, right? That's pretty obvious. But then uh, what might not be as obvious as well is that your glue joint between the scarf joint, here, I'll try and mimic it right here. You can see right here that my glue joint, when I do a less of an angle, my glue joint is very broad, which means I have more surface area. But as I turn that headstock, and in the very extreme, when I go 90 degrees, you can see my glue joint is just the thickness of the headstock, right? See that? So broad, lots of surface area at a low angle. And as you increase the angle, you get less surface area to that glue joint. So it's, it's weak. As you increase that angle, it's weakening on two different, uh, for two different reasons, let's say. All right, let's check out another question here. Tony D has a question about bending glued veneers. He writes, I'm at the point where I want to glue some colored veneers and then bend them for the purfling. Is Type Bond able to withstand the heat? I have been using Type Bond Original for most of the guitar, but where things take longer to work on, I have been using Type Bond 3, for example, the ebony bindings on the back. And uh, LC Guitars responds with, I use Type Bond 3 for that, and it held good. Yeah, I would agree. Type Bond 3 is fine. I just use Type Bond, Type Bond Original. Uh, I will say, though, and this is important, I am bending on my side bending machines, not bending by hand on a hot pipe or anything like that. If you're hand bending, I, well, let me put it this way. On the, so when I use any glue, because I've even used cyanoacrylates, I've used super glue for this. And what I imagine is happening when I put it in the machine is that regardless of the glue that I use, the heat is so high that the glue has to be warming up to the point where it comes undone. I'm sure of that. But because of the way machine bending works, where you place it in this machine, you bring the shoe down, which presses the waist, and then you have a roller on each bout, the upper bout and the lower bout. Um, and you have these bending slats sandwiching the strips together all the while. So your strips, even though they're delaminating, whatever you glued together, that glue should be softening because of those rollers and the bending shoe kind of holding everything tightly down along with the slats, the spring steel slats that hold it together. All of that prevents the strips from separating during the process. So that glue will heat up and then uh, the strips stay together and the glue eventually cools down again and rehardens. At least that's my understanding of what's happening. Really, I'm just speculating on what's happening. It just makes sense to me. You're bringing it up to 260 degrees plus or minus. Um, you, you know, it might even go up to like 300 degrees. And uh, that's definitely enough to separate glue joints. So when I say go ahead and use type bond. I like to use type bond. I I'm saying it knowing that I'm using a side bending machine. That's not to say that it wouldn't work. There's, you know, straps that people use, these metal straps that you can buy or just, you know, you can use sheet metal you get from Home Depot when you're bending to kind of keep things held together. So eh, maybe it could work with hand bending, but I'm not sure. I am not sure. It's an interesting question. If somebody has any thoughts on that specifically or any experience with hand bending after gluing your purflings together I, I would be interested to hear that answer 
So let's check out the next question here. Alalush writes, anyone ever used an overhead pin router? It's very expensive, but so handy. Routing next level. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, I have never used one, but yeah, definitely very expensive. And hey, if you can swing it, there's a lot you can do with a real serious piece of equipment like that. In fact, he has a picture of one here and uh, honestly, it's making me want to buy one. Um, so yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't have <laughs> much else to say besides that. We'll, we'll see what everybody else chimes in with in the forum. LC Guitars writes, I got the final coats of nitrocellulose lacquer on my two Ghost T type guitars I'm working on. A few weeks to cure, then sand and buff. I am excited for these two. All right, that's cool. Ghost T types. I wonder, so this is electric guitar stuff, so I don't even know what that is. If someone could... Let me know what that means. I'd be very interested. But he's got some cool pictures of them up there hanging. They look pretty slick. I like the colors, especially like that pink, burgundy pink, if I had to uh, give it a name. All right, uh, let, you know what? Let's go check out YouTube. Let's give everyone a chance to get some comments and questions in here. So I'm gonna pull over to YouTube and see what questions you got. All right, John Ford writes on the video I just put out about doing repairs on cheap acoustic guitars. He writes, I found it very interesting. I run across more guitars like this than higher end models. Yeah, it's funny because that, that does tend to be true. I end up having to turn away when I'm doing repairs, which isn't all the time. I'm doing them right now, by the way. If you guys have any repairs, you can reach out to me and uh, either ship them out or come out to the shop. When I'm doing repairs, it's almost a little bit, if I have to say, annoying. <laughs> because you'll, you'll, you get so many inquiries about guitars that are just, it's not their fault, people, you know, there's a re they're coming to you for your expertise. They're not gonna know this, but you have to turn a lot of people away because they bring you certain instruments that you know, unless there's some extreme sentimental value, death in the family or something like that, there's some reason to keep this guitar going, you know that Anything you do, any small repair is just going to massively exceed the value of that instrument. Most guitars out there are like that, unfortunately. So the interesting thing is that a lot of these very low-end instruments are actually more difficult to repair because, uh, for some of the common repairs that you expect on acoustic guitars, because no thought was given in the design of the instrument to no consideration to it having to be repaired in the future. That's, you know, planned obsolescence in a sense, because they know that this guitar really, it's for a student player, someone just learning, and they're gonna upgrade to something else. And that guitar, you know, when it starts to have problems, which all guitars do after a while, it really should just go in the trash, unfortunately. I hate to say it, and I don't promote that. In fact, that's why you want to buy things and not just guitars. This is kind of a life principle here. You want to buy things that will last, right? That you're gonna use for a long time. A lot of people buy these inexpensive guitars because they're not all that committed to playing guitar yet, right? And then they upgrade later on. So it's a shame, it really is. It's a shame that, that there's just no you know reasonable way to repair a lot of these guitars and uh, actually get paid for your time, which is important too. Let's see, some other comments on that same video here. Mark Pell writes, first impression is this decades old Carlos presents as a nice looking guitar and obviously it's been cared for pretty well cosmetically or at least not abused. I love to see that. You're right that a simple truss and action job, including a new straight bone saddle and accepting whatever intonation that gives is the most this guitar is worth, but it probably has some extra sentimental value as a pass down from father to son. Yeah, I actually, in the video, I said I wasn't going to replace the saddle with a bone saddle. I was just gonna leave this really jacked up plastic saddle on there. I mean, this, you know, this guitar is really cheap, so it's, he did not wanna spend a lot of money on it. But I actually ended up the next day, you don't see this on the video, the guitar was sitting there and I was just like, nah, screw it. And I pulled the little shitty plastic saddle off there, you know, went over to the belt sander and fired it up and pulled out a, a little bone blank and made a new saddle for it. So 
I ended up putting a new saddle on it anyway, and I just didn't charge it, <laughs> which is dumb. But I make good money on a lot of the other repairs that I do, and so sometimes I... Sometimes something just gnaws at you, and you're just like, mm, I know this guitar isn't worth it, and I know I'm not going to get much, uh, really, even out of this customer, but I, I, I just don't want to send it back um, as it is. So I put in the extra work. Uh, wasn't wasn't too big of a deal, but then he writes. So I'd ask. So what he would do, Mark Pell, he would ask the dad if he'd pay for a couple extra hours um, to have him do yeah the extra work. Now I get what you're saying. So, and I did do that. So I'd already gathered from speaking to him that there wasn't the extra sentimental value. It was just you know a cheap guitar that he wanted to. Um, kind of get playing okay and you know the budget considerations always come in then and most of the time that disqualifies doing anything to the guitar when it's a really cheap guitar but uh, we found um, a common ground that we could work on all right DALG guitars writes thanks for the link I think this guy has written a bunch for the Guild of American Luthiers yeah he's talking about RM Matola. he writes a lot of articles some of the best like most scientific articles for the Guild of American Luthiers magazine. It's called American Luthery, and if you're not subscribed to that, and you're subscribed to this, you watch me here, honestly, you really should. It's a paid subscription, and I don't get paid for telling you about it, but it's that good that I just want to tell you about it. It's a print magazine from the Guild of American Luthiers, and it really is better than anything you can get just perusing around YouTube. Honestly, guys, I mean that. As this is coming from someone who creates YouTube content, the articles in that magazine are so deep. They're, they're literally like, they're, it's like a thesis. A lot of them are written almost as scientific uh, abstracts. Is that, I don't know, the, I'm not a college professor, but they're really, really well done. You know what it is, is this world that we're in, uh, acoustic luthery there's so many retired people that are active in this world that's basically what the guild of american luthiers relies on and so a lot of these guys are like and and i know because they I've, i know many of them because they come and they take my courses and a lot of these guys are really smart engineers and you know working i've had people come take my class that worked for nasa jet propulsion lab laboratories and uh when they retire, this is just something to do. And so a, a lot of energy is being committed from people who, you know, spent a life in engineering and now are freed up to just pursue leisurely things like building guitars. So it's pretty cool that that drives a lot of this innovation. At least I think it does. Pretty cool. Okay. Um... And this is on the video I did about acoustic guitar compensation. And I provided there a little shorthand for figuring out, comp not even figuring out, I gave you a cheating way of adding your compensation. You can just do 2.3 millimeters on the treble side and 4.9 millimeters on the bass side. And that'll work for almost any, it'll work okay. It's, you know, if you really want to get into the, get it down to just a sort of mathematically precise intonation uh, you can do that but you could also just for shorthand or at least to check your work you can use 2.3 on the treble 4.9 on the bass and uh vernon knight was asking is that 2.3 4.9 from the center line so really what it is if you took a straight edge and you ran from nut to saddle your full scale length along the line of where the treble string will run. So that's not really the center. The treble string is going to run at an angle from the nut to the saddle. That's just how your strings splay out. So take a straight edge and mark out your full scale length and then add 2.3. And then go to the bass string. Mark out your full scale length, nut to saddle, at whatever angle your string splay is and then add 4.9 millimeters for the bass side. It's that simple, if you want it to be that simple. <laughs> There's 
complex calculators and things like that 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 RM Matola guy made. And so you can check that out on his website or just use that shorthand of 2.3 and 4.9. Okay, Sir Eric. Ooh, I'm a sir. And this is from Ialami Kilamare. Ialami Kilamare. Right, Sir Eric, so after the string compensation adjustment on the saddle slot, would it be recommended to put a compensated saddle for more accuracy? Yeah, it's always better to use a compensated saddle. So in the acoustic guitar world, you see straight saddles that are just a crowned piece of bone. And so in that case, your intonation point is running right along the dead center, the peak of that crown. So all your intonation points are straight in a line, which is not perfect, but the reason that exists in the world, and even on very nice guitars sometimes, is because it's close enough that it isn't really a problem. I mean, some of the greatest songs ever recorded are recorded on a guitar without a fully compensated saddle. So it's not a make or break thing. I think it's, it's almost one of those things. I, I always like it depends on what I'm building, but I don't always use a fully compensated saddle, but I sometimes compensate the saddle fully. It's almost more of a psychological thing where you just want to know that, uh, that it's perfect, right? But if I play either a straight saddle or a fully compensated saddle, I feel the same. If the guitar is a guitar that I really like, I haven't noticed any itch in me when I'm playing to fix uh, some problem that I'm hearing from the saddle, if that makes sense. <laughs> so anyway, let's talk about LMI. Luthier's Mercantile is closing, which is crazy. I mean, obviously, business is slow just for everyone, for reasons that were entirely predictable and obvious, and we all understand them, but for some reason we don't talk about them. Uh, <laughs> Business is slow, but I'm surprised. The only thing I'm surprised about is that, you know, a major supplier of Luthery is closing its doors and nobody's buying it. Like, this isn't a mom and pop place. This is Luthier's Mercantile. This is the West Coast version of Stu Mac is just calling it quits and just liquidating everything and selling it, which is why it's kind of like plunder time right now. <laughs> Everyone's... uh I've actually been trying to get a hold of Chris from LMI to be able to get a list of some of the large equipment that they have there, which I might be interested in buying, but he's so inundated with stuff that I, I just, I honestly can't get it out of him. A lot of that stuff is probably already gone, already sold to someone, but on their website too, this might be interesting to you guys, they are having, they're just trying to clear everything out. So if you're not on their email newsletter, uh, you should get on that just so you can see all the you know massive deals as they you know as the plundering continues <laughs> i've already bought a couple things I a whole bunch of bridge pins because i know that the bridge pins that i like i get from them and only from them and so once they go i have to it's not a big deal but i, I really have to find new bridge pins and that kind of affects the aesthetic of the instruments that i have so i don't want to have to sort of re rethink certain things and uh fretwire i get my evo gold from them i bought the last two i think i bought the last two coils of evo gold 100 foot coils so if you go on their website and they're out of it now that's my fault sorry yeah they're out of truss rods that was a big thing too i tried to get some because i only get my truss rods from lmi but that those went i feel like first i think a lot of people were only getting their truss rods from lmi so in a sense, there's opportunity here for, you know, some young entrepreneur out there who wants to take up the mantle of making truss rods for everyone or whatever else we're now missing. Can't even think of, if I sat here and, th and thought long enough, I could think of all the things that I relied on LMI for and uh, that you guys rely on LMI for that nobody else at the moment provides. So there's lots of opportunities to provide those the community anyway it's sad it's now just Stu Mac <laughs> there isn't even a close third that's the funny thing like I don't even know who I would say is you know Stu Mac was you could you could argue is in first place always and LMI was second 
but sort of a close second. I don't even know who would be third. After that, it's like distant, a distant third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Maybe allied Lou 3. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're just so much smaller than Stu McAnel and mine. Anyway, it's a crazy world. I hope that, you know, you guys take, a, take advantage of this opportunity and uh, get some of those deals. That's what I'm here to do to help you guys, alert you guys to stuff like this. So anyway, I'm going to close it off here. It's been fun. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.